Okay, welcome everybody to the Tuesday, September 12 meeting of the development team. So the working document is in the chat box. Uh, you can go to the OSC uh, devlog page on the wiki called development team log. If you want to get the history of all the meetings, you can click on September 12 and access the document. Okay, um, so where are we? This is, these are our numbers here of development hours and everything. So we're hovering about 200 hours per week, about 11 or 12 people logging time. So please, of course, log your time using the new timesheet. And uh, some product demos for today. Let's let's talk about. I mean, the main th focus right now is getting doing a good job on the tractor, and um, uh, it's actually coming along quite well here. So if you look at slide four, this is. Um, the current state of where we are. Now I don't know if uh, I know Josh if uh, he has worked on the loader arms, but uh, the next steps here are loader arms and some some improvements here. So let me share my screen. So slide four is a s static shot. As far as what what needs to happen, let's dive right into that as far as what what the tractor looks like so we see the tracks I mean it's not it's a it's a good model right now I mean it's not technically accurate in in places as in some things don't line up like just to mention some things like for example if you look at the motor the, the mounting plate is not correct the motor motor is up a little bit that's because if the sprocket uh, needs to clear this bottom bottom idler so I had to raise it up a bit the tracks are done using the path array. I did a little video on that. If you go to OSC YouTube, I'll put a link in there. Go to the YouTube one of some of the latest videos. I put a, a video about how to use the path array to make tracks. That works really nicely. It, it, I thought it would, the tracks would be a nightmare, but they're quite manageable with the if you want to with the path array and you, just using a line. So basically, you draw a line and then then use a little track piece select the track piece select the line and click click on the path array tool in draft workbench and that's that's all you need to do so that's pretty good i also did a little walkthrough video on the micro track right here also on youtube so the let's talk a little bit about the next steps on this uh let's see is josh here Josh, are you in on a meeting here? Yeah, Josh, uh, if that's you, have you um, gotten a chance to look at do any of the uh, loader arm geometry yet? Because that, that's the it's one of the big next steps. Okay, so that's, yeah, let's see what we got here. Um, all right, so I don't see any upload on your log uh, there, but we were looking at the uh, nice way to do this is in, in, the, in the workbench, the sketcher, drawing simple shapes. The nice thing about Sketcher is that you can when you draw a shape you can drag the points around to to make the geometry fit so that's good. Uh, we'll talk about that. So the power cube here that's that's looking good thanks Roberto that's that's looking quite nice. Um, the frame is 20 inches the power cube is 20 inches so so this is very nice and compact it's it's about 42 inches right now it's 43 inches currently as far as the width of the tractor and we want to get it to 42. These are 10 inch tracks, they're quite wide. We can make them like 9 or 8 even and it would still be quite acceptable. Uh, maybe make them 9 so that we still clear the sides here. Yeah, probably, they're, they're 10 inches right now, we'll probably want to make them like 9 inches so we, we can cut those out. Uh, some of the details here, you see that the tracks are not lined up on the idlers, the idlers need to be stretched out a little bit. Uh, the shaft that's looking good there, that's a solid connected shaft. I guess that was filled in there. There's a little piece there. So if these are the holders, so these bushings are supposed to go inside the uh, the tubing. 
if they're the the bushing for the shaft the shaft is what's going to actually span across so the shaft will go all the way across uh, to hold the, hold the loader arms it will connect the two verticals such that there's stiffness there and it will be a very nice tight connection and probably put collars for the shaft like in between here so the shaft can't slide one way or the other that will be a convenient place put the collars inside so that outside you've got uh, the loader arms hanging on the on the shaft now where would the two missing pieces where do the loader cylinders then go uh, right now the geometry at the back is tight uh, it's possible you can mount them somewhere here but that's close to the tracks probably the easiest thing to do is see if we can do a geometry where we've got the loader uh, arms mounted so put some kind of a structure here we've got some access here to some structure to some of the frame so if we build this up here go over the tracks because the tracks are low in the front if we go over the tracks and we can mount the cylinder about here somewhere somewhere here um, mount it somewhere in the front so that the the fixed end of the cylinder is somewhere here and then the cylinder is going up somehow like up vertically somehow to get the best geometry for the loader arms it's not optimal typically a cylinder is mounted towards the back but the cylinders are plenty strong so we can play with getting a cylinder maybe mounted at the front the way the geometry is um, the idea here is that because the tracks are so high up in the back um, there's not a lot of space to mount mount your cylinder here unless you expand these these arms vertically up and we try to we're trying to keep the <clears throat> center of gravity as low as possible in our case uh, so this is a very nice tight height right now overall height right now being only like like what here I'm showing 34 inches well look at that I mean that's really attractive we have 20 inches for the height of the power cube and that's it's not even 34 I should measure it better here um, let's see if I can go I can tell you it's 20 for the height four inches more here about four inches to the bottom of this this shaft and about um, just about six inches under the shaft so 14 plus 20 that sounds like about 34 that 34 is pretty pretty close to accurate actually let's get another see if I can get any better measurement here uh, to the bottom of the plate we got 28 and there's probably like um, about four about 32 height we are at right now I mean that's really excellent uh, very low and uh, quite good what else is missing the missing is the idler if you put on the tracks you need to tension them right now what we can do is probably uh, I was I was thinking about two ways one is I mean we can definitely do some kind of an idler here where we put a shaft through the middle of the uh, the frame or under the frame probably the middle of the fr uh, through the right through the frame uh, so that it's not getting in the way of the tracks at all so the tracks would never end up rubbing against it but do a shaft through here put one of the idlers the smaller ones these are t the, the 12 inch idlers uh, you can say 10, 10 inch call them 10 inch do the 8 inch idlers the smaller ones that we also had from the previous build and make it rotate such that you can lift this idler kind of up and push up against the track so they will po push up that's one way um, that's a bunch of parts more idlers more more bearings more shafts um, which made me think about like is there some way that we can put these two motors I mean why not maybe mount the two motors in such a fashion that the whole motor assembly one side, one and the other on the other side which is not shown right now we're showing only one motor but what if we could so let's view it in orthographic view here um, what if we just somehow put an assembly here 
where I don't know maybe mount the motors on some kind of a plate against the the verticals here such that a bolt could simply lift up that entire assembly and move the tracks up now that would be the easiest so that means that uh, you lower the sprocket all the way down you put on your track and you have enough looseness so you can actually get the pin in because the way you do it it's like a chain on a bicycle uh, you take out a pin and then connect the track through the one of the, any one of the pins I mean these are all pins one inch pins with the washer on them um, take out the pin and put on the track and then you have to tension it and you see here the sprocket is sticking up a little bit too high we need to probably uh, raise the tracks just a little bit to be a little more accurate but uh, you also see that the spacing between the tracks is just a little too big here so so in the path array tool I selected the number of tracks is 34 right now so maybe making it maybe like 40 would close up that gap and make it actually more accurate this is just kind of for for show um, but I'm thinking I don't know this uh, it looks attractive in order not to mess with the idlers uh, basically the the whole complex assembly underneath the tractor it would really be nice to leave all this alone I mean that's under the tractor you know not super easily accessible I'm thinking about like super easy access uh, looks like the tensioning of the motors would best be done through the back here now that's where the, the little stand for the operator would also be if this is a, a a ride behind tractor have a little platform for the operator um, but it would be very convenient and accessible to have a tensioning mechanism right in the back so I think we could probably think about something like that I'll, I'll um, means a plate we can do as simple as a plate that's here and and some kind of a tensioning bolt that's just sticking up on top here that's actually quite uh, quite doable if we have these arms here vertically like this they're a good attachment flat attachment surface so here this kind of opened up here is a very convenient attachment point for some kind of a plate that could slide up and down to tension the motors up and down so I'm kinda leaning towards that right now simply because that is very accessible as opposed to having to work under the tractor like uh, you know mounting under the tractor or poking a hole through this one of these beams here um, that is an attractive proposition what else here after the loader arms and the tensioning we've got controls so so solenoid valves which would go on on just a bar here operator would push the levers here and then on a on a loader we want a quick attach plate so basically a mechanism where you have both lift of the loader and a curl of a quick mounting plate for implements so you can mount anything uh, it's a curl curl motion on on a quick quick attach loader so what's a loader uh, loader let's do loader quick attach plate say take some images here so if you've got a loader you've got some kind of a mechanism where you can attach implements so this would be like you know say take this one that would be uh, that looks like a bobcat standard that's a bobcat and what it has is these arm these little fingers here that you put the implement upon them they're an inclined thing you put the implement across this and then you have this lever here that pokes this bolt down through a hole in the bottom part of the implement. Uh, you can take a look at the Bobcat quick attach on the wiki. Uh, I, I should uh, put a link to that in the work doc. Uh, Bobcat standard. That's we want to do that because as I said we can then fit all implements from other bobcats which are common there's millions of them out there 
we can use them on this little tractor. Uh, on the wiki, Bobcat, let's see what pops up, pops up under Bobcat, but um, Life Track Bobcat Standard right here. Uh, let's say Life, Life Track Bobcat Standard. We had another page on this here. We did some work before we actually, so this is like, you can look at this here, exploring the geometry here. We actually drew this up in, in, in LibreCAD before, like we've got the full technical specs here. So you can, you can take a look at that. And this is, this is what we did actually on Life Track 6, this kind of a mechanism. Um, so it's, it's well documented. This was a thing in SketchUp. So we did this thing which got your incline here. And then this bolt was was here, and it's it's uh, you got to do be pretty precise on that because uh, the geometry is quite specific. But that's already developed. We want to do this this more or less worked decently, but it's kind of like the got this two point thing. It's not good. Those things can bend under heavy weight, even though that's half inch steel. Uh, so, but you can take a look at that uh, more linked to the working document so next steps loader arms curl cylinder and of course the cylinders there the the quick attach and then curl cylinder we might want to discuss that just a little bit uh, just for roll allocation here so let's do that but I'll go through some of the other items so uh, if you want to take a look at the YouTube we got a nice two-minute promo video on the 3d printer workshop um, we need some registrations for that. The event is occurring on October 30, and the second day of that, we're still doing the filament maker, so I'm still printing parts right now and sourcing all of that. But you can take a look at this video. It's a nice video, uh, just a two-minute short on the event. Thank you, Dixon. Uh, that's that's the footage was taken at the October 12 event here. And then next, I just posted. If you look at the this workshop here. If you look at that link, I posted the, the experimental CNC torch build. So um, take a look at that. That's what we've got, and we're going to build it. That will be October, uh, what is it, October 14, 15? Um, 14, 15, Saturday, Sunday. And we're going to take it, this time around, going to change the workshop format a little bit to be more design-build. So this is definitely a design-build workshop where the first day, we're going to spend half the day on FreeCAD and manipulating the design and uh, actually getting people trained up in the FreeCAD skill. So everything from uh, modifying the parts to extracting uh, fabrication drawings and primarily fabrication drawings and, and modifying parts in FreeCAD so that anyone can understand our files and work with them effectively and then throw in that design component so that when we build that day people kind of work off the various fabrication drawings and details that we can generate uh, in the first half of that day so that should be pretty good it'll be a kind of a hands-on free CAD which is somewhat first time for the level of intensity on a free cut where we're actually training people actively on it and that's that's pretty good uh, and this infographic is an old one from a few years ago but it's still quite relevant except we've got the universal axis right now instead of instead of doing uh, this kind of rail system <clears throat> I've also talked to some people about actually to some experts on on belt drive like GT2 belts which have half a thousandth or about 10 micron positioning accuracy and by multiplying them up by by doing like two inches wide of belt either two or four inches wide of belt on an axis uh, the universal axis with very thick rods like two inch rods uh, we're aiming for half a thousandth of accuracy for heavy duty CNC machining and when you say heavy duty we mean a machine that can have at least 200 pounds of working strength for tool drive so say you got a CNC mill milling bit 
or a lathe bit you can punch that into the workpiece with say like 200 pounds or 100 kilos of force for heavy duty machining I think we can end up I mean nobody in the world does belt drive for heavy duty machines the industry standard is ball screws all metal but in our case I think we can actually do the belts I did some initial calculations using belt stretch and so forth and and just back of the envelope calculations do indicate that it's possible to make a workable machine and we might may have to go slower uh, on the feed rate now is that acceptable if we talk about decentralized production we're not talking about maximum throughput of say like a hundred parts or you know a hundred parts a day maybe whatever that is say we are decreased in our feed rates or speed of machining even like tenfold well if you've got a, a community scale shop you're you're interested in say maybe one-off production you, you want one per day that's our current business model we produce one of something per day and I think in that in that sense the uh, the belt drive could work even if you have slower feed rates you can still produce something you just let the machine go overnight like a 3d printer doing its machining slowly while you don't have to worry about it because you reduce the feed rates if the belt drive allows us to do not the maximum performance like an in industry which is going to be the case the belt is not going to get you that much but the question is is it acceptable is it workable and, and I think the answer is yes from initial calculations so we've got the CNC torch experimental workshop in October I'm looking at uh, November like mid-November do an experimental heavy-duty CNC machine workshop I've already done you know I've got a little bit of experience like the heavy-duty drill press if you google that We've already built hydraulic drill presses uh, here uh, that could drill like one-inch holes. Heavy-duty drill press, o OSC. Uh, you can see a video. Um, no, it's not coming up. Heavy-duty drill press, open source ecology. The prior work was where we took a hydraulic yeah here's the open source drill press prototype one here so it was a big thing it had a hydraulic motor on it um, and this is like the actual tool bit this one inch bit it just ate up the metal like very sweet but that's that's the build video there um, you can take a look at that I'll just put a link on a document to the drill press this was that's the that's from old times ago but the thing is it's um, we can build these larger heavy-duty machines as well we've done the drill press we did a lathe prototype so we know it works and we know how to do the structure now we're gonna add the CNC to that but this time around use both hydraulics hydraulic for the heavy-duty motor that actually does the milling or lathing and then stepper motors for the drive on the axes uh, so and once again using the same technique GT2 belt is what we use in a 3d printer make it fatter and wider and multiply it and you've got heavy-duty drive the breaking strength of GT2 belt is 800 pounds for one inch of belt so you can safely operate say maybe like 25 percent of that so 200 pounds per inch of belt so the, the numbers look good actually um, so say you got two belts or two inches that's 400 pounds of working strength or if, or if you quadruple the belts like a quadruple axis which we can possibly do for heavy duty 800 pounds of working force that's not peak force that's working force that's excellent I mean so the initial indication is that we can do a belt driven uh, heavy duty machining using the same universal axis okay next so next topics it's moving right on uh, Roberto is moving forward on other ways to I asked him about uh, exploded part drawings like when we have a complete machine done like the brick press in, into your product manual what you want to do is an overall huge explosion drawing with every every single part down to every single bolt so that's gonna be a lot of parts like for the brick press that's probably like 300 if you include all the bolts here it's quite manageable for say that this is the extruder for filament making 
this actually doesn't show all the parts even it's it's missing the power supplies and everything underneath but you see how many different parts there are so this is doing a different workflow within FreeCAD this is not Roberto's language agnostic instructional script or the isometric extraction macro this is another route which uh, maybe Roberto you want to pipe in on your latest findings on this because the the thing the only thing that I mentioned was an issue on this is that it's pixelated it's not that accurate but uh, Roberto can you pipe in on this um, well what I can say now is that uh, this procedure is, is much more easier than the, the procedure used in the language agnostic instructional um, and about the um, the quality of the image. I, yeah. I think that it, it can be. Uh, I, I'm not um, already. Uh, I, I'm not. I have not um, done um, a research about that. So, uh, but uh, but I think that it is. It, it should be possible to to improve the image quality. Uh huh. Now, how do you do that? If it's got those pixels like it has right now. What I think uh, uh, at this moment, without uh, having, uh, uh, without doing any any attempt or research, is uh, only um, to zoom zoom in um, in the three D view before doing the screenshot. So. Uh huh. You can take, uh, let's see, four different screen screenshots for each uh -huh. part of the complete uh -huh. scene. So then you can just put the, those screenshots together uh -huh. and zoom out, and then, then you will have a better resolution. Yeah, okay. So zooming in, so a little, little bit of manipulation, It's uh, which means just a little bit more work and maybe... I don't know if we can go into the code and see if we could clean it up just like we um, if that can be done through pro some programming because uh, I don't know we might have to get at the code I mean it will be less convenient if we have to do multiple screenshots it will add to the work so maybe the eventual thing is actually programming up some improvements if needed but yeah that's a workable way uh, zooming in and taking multiple shots um, that's good and your yeah, Christian, Christian says that a macro can do it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe there, there's a. I, I, I think that the, there's other possibilities, but I, I'm just no. I have I have not researched nothing. Right. Yeah, definitely. But that would be, yeah. We we definitely want to add this capacity to our repertoire of what we do. But yeah, I think FreeCAD is, it's all coming together, I think. Yeah, that's good. And uh, what else here? Last thing maybe, and Roberto, any blocks on the, so you're working on a big workflow of importing, basically making assemblies in FreeCAD, is that going okay? Yeah, I had a, a last question about the the power cube in, in the in the micro track. Yeah. Is is the power cube going to be um, separated into parts also? In in the for example in the exploded uh, parts of the micro track, you will have the the master. I mean the power cube as a single uh -huh. object, or it will be also a. a separated into different parts. I think it makes sense because the power cube is such a distinct unit we can keep that as one part but then we would have to have another file which where we can simply have the power cube all exploded in, in another shot so maybe we have for the manual for the tractor we would have one explosion for the tractor and another explosion for the the power cube I think that would make sense since it's such a clear division such a clear module I, I think that would be pretty good what do you think? I agree. Yeah, let's do that. Since we, I mean, 
you know, there's a limit to how much you can do and still be able to read a diagram. But because we have low parts count in general, we can pretty much break up the entire tractor. But yeah, it's it's useful to separate the power cube. Yeah, that sounds good. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then, so maybe last one, one more item is the gasifier itself. So, um, I talked to Troy Martz, who who built gasifiers before he quit that, but um, we are still planning on a gasifier for the the workshop, the tractor workshop, which is at the end of October, October 27th through the 29th. So we did a simple gasifier last time. We're going to do a little smaller version with a better uh, so-called carburetor, better air inlet valve. But you can click on the gasifier link to see the notes that we have so far. I mentioned about the link of 3D printing to gasifiers. If you print in ceramics, ceramics are high temperature materials that you can actually end up 3D printing. So basically print in clay, clay paste that you then fire. But then you can 3D print the hearth, the the core of the the gasifier, which has got this gasifier here has a it's basically a charcoal burner. Put charcoal inside of it, but there's a very high temperature flame inside there that generates the carbon monoxide fuel for the engine from hydrogen. From uh, sorry, it's uh, what is it? Carbon a uh, carbon is charcoal. Charcoal is the fuel. Uh, it burns partially inside the chamber to release the the gases that the engine then burns but it's very high temperature so it's useful to do 3d printing there for high temperature ceramic which is another link in the product ecology of of OSC um, okay feel free also to put any questions and comments how's it how's everything going on an OSC ISO I haven't gotten a chance to to actually play with the new version I need to do that I'll do that today right after this meeting um, anyone else have any any reports to pump in on this uh, so please uh, for that keep putting in your reports on the OSC Linux wiki page so OSC Linux uh, there's a spreadsheet there um, who's provided feedback so far I put my feedback in the um the slide, mm -hmm. and, um, slide number two. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, I've seen that, and um, I'm not quite sure. You you used the most current version, uh, weren't you? So the f zero four point five, right? I I installed the the last uh, version the. September 9th. All right. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's kind of strange because um, on my version I do have the exploded part uh, animation. Yeah. Yeah. What we have in is is the is that another workbench, the 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 one that we are using now. There are two, or I I don't think this this more, but there are almost two. I'm, I'm All right. So so, so it's the two. wrong version. Dude. Uh, to get it right. The, yeah, I see the exploded assembly workbench in the current. I, I know, I, I, uh, exploded animation. That, that, that's what, what was the name of the workbench that I see in the OSC Linux installation. And my and, and what, the, the the workbench that, that we are using at the moment is is named exploded assembly. Okay, so uh, there, there was a wrong link provided to me, I guess. So I've, no, I think uh, we need both. Thought was in the link there. Um, could you maybe? Uh, there, there's on the left side of this of this Excel sheet. You see uh, the, the links I'm using, um, and there has to be. Um, I put the link in the slide number two, under F E. Okay, I can I can find it, find it there as well. All right, so uh, EPBA. let's see what's the deal. So we've got the exploded part animation workbench. This is not the right one here. As far as I've understood it, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So JMG one. Um, I'll have to 
Yeah. Okay. So that is Just that is the correct link in uh in the spreadsheet then. Yeah, it, it it actually looks right to me. I think that's the one I've added. Roberto, is yeah. that that the correct one that we want to use, right? Uh, I don't. I'm not. I I I'm not seeing the spreadsheet. What? what? Well, if um, you go into the uh, spreadsheet, yeah, link. Maybe maybe provide the link. Um. Okay, here's that link to the oh. Explorer Part Animations. Thank you. Um, that's weird because it, I think I think that's the one I've installed. If I'm not mistaken, there it looks it looks right. Um, could it be that it is some more current version or anything? How did you install it? Did it you install it via Git or uh, with the add-on manager? Because I used the add-on manager because I thought this was the more, more easy part, but I can do it the other way as well. Um, I installed it, um, I think, using the... Uh, do, or just downloading the, 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 the files and just pasting the, in the FreeCAD folder. All right, so yeah, I've, I've used the add-on manager. Maybe the add-on manager is not up to date, but actually this is kind of recommended here, so that's the first one I use. I can also do the other thing. Maybe it's actually that your version is a bit more current than the one that's used in the add-on manager. That's, that's of course possible. Um, oh, could be. I, I just see the, <laughs> the tools available in the, in the OSC Linux version and there, there were, there were different. There's another workbench, I, I think. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's the same. Wait a second. Let, let's compare the link just, just to be sure. Where is it? Um, Explore part animations right here. So that's yeah, it, it's the same one. It's, it's the same link. So I'm not quite sure uh, well, why this looks different, because that's of course the only way I've seen it before, so... Um. Could be, uh, um, you're using the point seventeen or the sixteen? I've installed it via the point seventeen. however, um, it's installed for both, because they are using actually the same folder, so in both packs that is installed, however you have both on installed on the OSC Linux, as you can see. Okay. So. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Maybe, maybe maybe you can you can look in, into it as well. Maybe you could install it via um, uninstall the one that's that's there at the moment. It's installed your way and look whether it looks different. Or I can do that as well. Um, because, like I said, I don't know how it should look to you. That, that that's my problem. Otherwise, I would try or, to make it. I, I I will try to to open the OS Linux and and join this meeting, so I can I can show you the, my screen from from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, but but like I said, uh, I I don't know how it should look. So it's it's not. Uh, okay. I've, I'm I'm pretty sure I, I I know how it looks for you because it looks like from it does for me. But, um, I, can, I, can, I can show you now what, 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 how, how my screen looks. Yeah, that, that's, that might be more interesting. Okay. Um, for can the you see my screen? Not yet. A bad connection. Oh. No, we can't see it. Are you sh trying to share? Yeah, I'm sharing. I'm not getting it. Oh. Yeah, not still, still nothing. Oh, I can, I can send you a, a screenshot to your email. Yeah, yeah, you can do that as well. Uh, do a, paste the screenshot so, into the can, dev doc. Can paste a, get it, yeah, right, exactly. Paste post it into the development doc. Um, which is Abe, uh, public. So you, you had a connection error. That's it's it's actually a drive link. You know that, so uh, it has.
has to be working, I guess. Uh, I I think uh, I haven't ever heard about about issues of downloading from Google Drive. It's if if there is, I, I can I can think of some um, alternative, but uh, it would be new to me. It's it's okay. Um, it, my connection is poor sometimes here. And I'll just have to download it overnight uh, again. It it doesn't take that many hours. Uh, not student night, and uh, I I may find a download manager that works with Google Drive. I copied it to my Google Drive. I mean, once once it's more stable, obviously a BitTorrent will help everybody have better access. But for right yeah, now, I'll, I'll do that, of course. But um, maybe a little tip: Pilot is is pretty good at this, I think. So when when you don't know how to how to add it, just start the download and take the link from where it is downloaded. So in your download manager, Control J in Chrome, and and paste it in there. So then it, it kind of it kind of resembles the download you did with your browser, and you don't have to give a, a drive link to to your a special download manager because it actually has then the right download link that's. With, the, with token and everything that, that normally works in about 90% of the cases. Yeah, I'll, I'll try that. Um, I, I think I know a couple things I can try to improve that. Okay. Uh, I yeah, tried yeah. even using Chromium to um, adjust the bandwidth. There, there is a uh, bandwidth limiter in Chromium. Oh, but nice. It's integrated into the... Um, it's in the technical... Uh, I can't remember what they call it now. It's in the the analysis of uh, the pages and stuff, it's kind of in there deep in a bunch of technical stuff, but I think you have to start it and set it up before you start the downloads. And I'm not sure if it works with the download page yet or not either. I, I didn't get it to work, but because so, sometimes that helps if you can control the, the speed and stuff too, but um, mostly my connection just varies here, and I, I know there's probably a few people with that issue, but um, yeah, I didn't test uh, the OSC Linux previous version extensively either, other than uh, just checking the stuff in their loads. It, it looked like in the new newest version that you're getting a lot of the icons and the um, the Unity bar set up and more the the customizations in though. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so there's the customization. There are um, this. All other bunch of software uh, that was a bit corrected. For example, the um, Arduino was the wrong version. Um, so just just a bit of adjustment, and the main issue remains um, the driver problems. And I I'm a bit at a loss because I don't know what to do because it works fine for me. And what? Um, sorry, I was wondering what build method you're using. If you're, uh, I, yeah, I, I looked yeah, at different I, I options before. Yeah, um, I, I haven't so, looked at your document. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's not yet document. document. That, that's what I mean. It's uh, okay. something I want to, I want to put up uh, right after that. Um, I'm using a GitHub project called Composer. It's basically a core of Python um, that's compiled into a depth file. It's pretty small, and it's actually not everything's working. I actually had to rewrite a little bit of the Python code. That's why I'm a bit afraid of, of putting that down into a documentation, because uh, this is getting a bit, uh, well, it, it, it looks kind of weird how I, how I did it, but, but it, it works. That, that does sound more compli complicated than I thought, because I think I saw a shell script recently somebody had posted. I thought that was for the ISO build, but I know there's different steps. I know it was yeah, done. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've seen that. That's, that's the one that didn't work for me because that's the one where the where the boot sector wasn't set up and where the, the ISO file didn't work. So I used an alternative, and this one has a GUI, so it, it, it has basically um, a better, um, it looks better, I, I, I could say it like that. So I have a kind of a manager and an own user that's that's created, and inside that user file uh, directory, there's uh, there's the file system and everything, and it's pretty convenient. So 
you can clean it up and uh, provide it another ISO and stuff like that, and it rounds everything up by itself, so it's um, quite more easy. Like like I said, there was just a little bug, and I had to resolve it by changing like five lines. I didn't find that error on the on the page, but um, as I know a little bit of Python, I could I could kind of interpret um, what's going wrong, and uh, I that w were just five five lines commented out, so it's actually no magic there, it's just just a few lines. Okay, I wasn't sure how much you were changing the packages, because that DNS air thing seemed odd on the wire, and I still haven't... I didn't no, 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 it's, it's, actually, it's actually nothing of the, of the, of the, of the Linux uh, uh, distribution itself. I, I can show you actually um, how it is pa packaging the, the file system back. Because that t part of the script was what I was modifying, but it's also where you can see what is happening. What I was taking out was actually um, it, it it couldn't it couldn't find out what kind of kernel it was using. So I just put in use the default kernel, and that's actually 64 bits. So it's it's the, just the normal stuff, right? So not, nothing weird happening there. And um, before that. He couldn't quite find it, and therefore he tried to app get install a file that wasn't there because the kernel version was wrong or, or was just empty or something like that. So I had just to put that out. Um, but it shouldn't it shouldn't actually uh, destroy anything in the in the um, in the Linux version. And like I said, uh, my internet is working fine. I, I don't know what, what what happened on your side. However, um, what, what I wanted to ask you is, uh, so with the DNS error, there's always one thing that's interesting, and that's, um, can you ping your router? So is it is it that you cannot find your router, or is it that you can't go out into the internet? It, it, got, it gets the DHCP data from the router, and I can ping the router. All right. In so. Chromium, or I think I, well, I don't know if Firefox was in there, but in Chromium, you know, I tested it. It comes up it says yeah. DNS, any other tests, it's not right. passing DNS somewhere. So uh, ju just for the testing, did you try to ping 8888 or 8844, maybe, or something like that? Oh, I, I did not do that. I should try that. I didn't think about checking an yeah. external... Yeah, that is. Okay. Yeah, that, that I, made. I don't know, but but that's the first thing I do when when DNS lookup errors happen. Maybe just ping the DNS server and see whether the IP itself is working or not. So yeah. However, yeah. I'm I'm a bit at a loss, like I said, because I can't physically see a computer, and without that, I can't quite say anything about what's what's happening. Yeah, it seems to be just that version of, of Linux, obviously. Obviously, everything else uh, works. So I don't see it being the router or the, the internet works for everything else. So it's like the connection to the DNS and that version of Linux isn't quite right. Uh, I mean, obviously, just by process of elimination. Um, it must be okay. something related to that, that system booting up. Okay. So but um, I... That's, that's that's actually pretty weird because, like I said, it's working for me. So it, uh, and as the hardware is connected correctly, as you can ping your router. Um, yeah, it's uh, strange. Yeah, I, actually, the DNS server is not provided by your Linux normally, but most of the time it's provided by your router. So that's actually something uh, on that uh, yeah, on that side. It's. I, and like also the, the internet connection is if you have to the router, basically the router can send you every internet package. So yeah, yeah it's, I run, it's weird. I'm running Linux Ubuntu 1604 LTS normally. That's what I'm using right now. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's, that's also 1604. Uh, what what I use it. So it's it's odd to me <laughs> so far. I um, hopefully doesn't occur in the new version because I, yeah, I, I don't know yet what's going on there. I, well, I'm using 604 as well. That that's a problem. So so I'm not not really sure what 
uh, what else is going on, so... Mm. That's really weird. Oh, I, one thing I didn't do was run a... Um, well, I don't remember, is there a, a menu option uh, for running the Squash FS, uh, what is it, a CRC check for the whole disk system? I think that's sometimes an option on, boot, on the boot menu. Uh, the the one, uh, sorry, sorry, I think some of these uh, live CDs, a lot of times they, they have an option on the boot menu to run a uh, CRC check, and it checks like the whole uh, disk or you know image. Uh, yeah, in the, in, I'm, in the squash I think it, it does that per default. I'm I'm not quite sure, but um, well, it, it has the MD5 sums, so basically you can do it. You can actually do it without booting it up. Yeah, that's MD5 true. There. Uh, but well, I think they they include it as an option on some of the, well, probably since there were CDs, and of course, I think the whole, unfortunately, that whole ISO, all that stuff is kind of an extra thing that's left over from the area of, era of CDs, which we're not using anymore. So it's all kind of uh, a lot of extra stuff, really. But um, I, I assume that's what the CRC check was included on the menu, because you're likely to get more errors on a, uh, a CD or something like that. Yeah, it cannot hurt to have it, right? So, yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know that a USB stick would necessarily need that. It's unless the stick goes bad, which. It's basically something you have to set up because I don't think it will work if you don't provide uh, the MP5 sums. So I am pretty, pretty confident that it actually tests it on every startup. Um, I don't know, uh, but however, uh, keep keep me uh, keep me informed. Uh, what, Roberto, what, what what about the uh, image? Yeah, I, I just sent you the, an email. Ah, via email. Sorry, sorry. I thought you were uh, putting it on the on the presentation. I was waiting there. Very sorry. Oh, oh yeah, it's <laughs> a good idea. <laughs> All right. So okay, now now I can see it. All right. So. Yeah, I'll I'll compare it and I'll try it around until it looks like for you because that's that's kind of the the goal we were trying to do. We want to look, want it to look like uh, everyone is comfortable with it. So right. Uh, Roberto, okay. can you paste so, that paste that for a record in in the document so we can keep track of that while you have it? Yes, I will do that. Yep. Okay. Um, Michelle, do you have any report on WebGL? Well, uh, I'm still uh, figure, figure out the, the right workflow from FreeCAD uh, exporting uh, using the assembly workbench, uh, reducing the file size. Yeah, still a lot of work to do, uh, but I'm getting there. Uh, I'm, I made a spreadsheet that um, simplifies the work enormously. Uh, you just have to put in the, the names uh, of the parts and um, then a lot of the code for uh, the movement um, and uh, the visibility of the parts is generated automatically. Uh, then it's uh, just like copy pasting it to uh, into the, the code uh, editor. So yeah, I'm creating a whole workflow and um, writing a script for the for the different uh, tutorials. Uh, but I'm getting there. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, first I want to break down like the, the right workflow before making the tutorials and uh, and sharing it with the uh, with the rest of you. Yeah. Uh, that is uh, really refined the, the process. Yeah, that's that's really good. If anyone hasn't seen this, this is the beauty that Michelle is doing. Uh, let me share my screen here and take a look at his log for the links to this beauty right here, which is excellent. I put, uh, put, put some links uh, of, of the power cube in, uh, in the chat. Um, I've been uh, testing like file reduction.
production uh -huh. uh, using Blender and the original export from um, from FreeCAD to Blender and then exporting from Blender was 8.3 megabytes for the mo model and then in Blender I uh, reduced, uh, decimated the, the, the model and now it's 1.9 megabytes. So you lose, One point point nine. You lose uh, some of the resolution, but for uh, an overview, it's, it's quite okay, I think. I have to zoom in to, to see the difference. Oh, wow. Let's see this. I like the bl nice and blue then, blue uh, colors. Well, I've, I'm, I'm using the, the, the theme... Uh, open source ecology uh, color scheme oh wow yeah, color scheme uh, I found uh, somewhere in the wiki and I'm, I've added some uh, buttons with uh, making parts visible <laughs> like so you can only watch the frame or the, the internals uh, the mechanics where show frame show mechanics uh, well, you can, uh, with the, the checkbox can, uh, oh yeah. Click. Like that, just showing the frame versus the mechanics. Yeah. 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 No, that's that is really cool. Yeah, that ma that really makes it this explosion feature. I mean, that makes it so transparent. Like when you can see every little part. That is good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's gonna be part of the of the tutorial. Uh, series uh, huh. like the explosion view and making parts visible uh, and certain parts uh, make a, a, a menu that you can make break it down like only the frame or only the mechanics or only the electronics something like that. yeah yeah that's really good I'm gonna copy that into the document really nice so the, the amount of work for uh, for the coding uh, is going to be drastically reduced using the, the spreadsheets. Uh huh. The spreadsheets the, are the spreadsheets actually generating some code for you? Well, it's or just uh, um, uh, combining certain cells. You, see, you you put in the, the names that you export uh, from Blender. You can copy paste them in into the spreadsheet, and then. Uh, um, how do I explain it? Like for the positioning, you have to uh, position X and then uh, refer to uh, the, the, uh, the other script, like uh, the explode parameter. It's a, it's a whole sentence. Eh? So if you, uh, now it's, it's all generated, um, just put in the names in the first uh, column, and then uh, you get a, a column with a, with all the names and the, um, the positioning and X, Y, Z uh, axis that is composed from different cells and then you can copy paste it into your code editor. Uh, so it, uh, yeah, it gives you a good code base to, to work from. And it's, uh, it's a, a huge reduction in, uh, in work. You can yeah. do it in the code editor, but it's much more transparent in the, in the spreadsheet. Okay. There will be a tutorial explaining how to work with it. Also. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and you're going to teach us how to do the co nice colors and all that? Because I know the, yeah, like you, you're doing very nice colors for all the different parts. That's that's going to be included in your instructional? Yeah. That's a bit of, it's, it's a pity that, um, that FreeCAD uh, doesn't export the colors. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, it's a, you have an OBG file, uh, and normally there goes an NPL file along with it, a material file uh, describing the colors of all the parts. And as far as I know, uh, FreeCAD doesn't export that. Right. Uh, Once again, we can add that to our FreeCAD programming list. Um, that would be nice. Uh, yeah. Uh, now it's some work like uh, giving all the parts a color in Blender. If you guys know any any programmers, um, invite them into the team because there's a lot of work to be done on on FreeCAD just to automate a lot of different workflows. 
So, definitely. Maybe York too. <laughs> yeah. I don't know about York. He's doing a lot of his own stuff. So, uh, we could hire him if we had some money, probably. But I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know the programming behind FreeCAD, but uh, generating the MDL file doesn't seem that difficult. Right. <laughs> yeah. So uh, what what you're trying to expo export are the colors, right? Yeah. So, um, I'm not quite sure whether this is possible with the OBJ because I probably the algorithm behind that is pretty long. I, I'm I'm not quite sure because I don't know how this version works. But um, maybe you could kind of make a little macro that's actually creating a second file, a little file that's just providing for each object a color, kind of an array. And then array together with that, you could then put them together, um, load both up, and uh, or, or merge them into an own file. I don't know. Maybe just provide both files to your um, to your HTML, and out of that, it could create that. So that that would be far more easy because it would be just a macro that's uh, reading out the colors. I think that yeah. would be uh, far less work. Yeah. 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 Well, the, the MTL file is. is very, uh, it's, it's human readable. Uh, it's um, ah, okay. Um, so normally, if you export a, an OBG file out of the 3D program, you have uh, it, it exports the the 3D shape and an OBJ and uh, the the color information and texturing if, uh, if there is texturing and an MTL uh, um, file. All right, and it, it does do that, okay. It doesn't export the MPL file. Uh, ah, okay. So, like, yeah. So basically what you're searching for is, is basically creating an MTL file. So so we yeah. have to have a kind of an MTL exporter for FreeCAD. But maybe someone, yeah. someone has done that before. Did you look that up or... Uh, do we uh, have to start from scratch? Actually, uh, I haven't looked it up. Uh, yeah, yeah uh, that may be that may be worth a look. Uh, and and what 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 I actually wanted to to to, to address, uh, Roberto wrote, uh, do we actually need uh, the exploding assembly um, mod for uh, FreeCAD if we have that WebGL? That's I I thought that was a good question. I just want to bring well, that up. Oh, the answer is of course because. I mean, WebGL is going to be its own animal, whereas the simple black and white, that would go into, into product manuals. So different formats for different things. The product manual, which is a printed copy, like say you even print it out and give it to a fabricator, they want to have this simple black and white drawing, So you, because you can't have that on paper. But then on electronic media, you would have the full-blown WebGL, and then, of course, in in augmented reality media, you would have, you know, different equipment, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah, so, of course. But uh, I think it would be kind of easier uh, if if we actually have that and would integrate that WebGL maybe a bit better into FreeCAD or or kind of interact with FreeCAD. Uh, wouldn't it actually be easier to just make a screenshot of the? Uh, of the area we want to have it, so uh, no problems with resolution or anything, and uh -huh. uh, so so more, more 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 angles and yeah, I, yeah. I think that would be more easy. And we could black and white it out afterwards with GIMP or anything, so that that wouldn't be maybe the issue. I think. Yeah, yeah, one thing at a time. Um, I'd say, yeah, but yeah, of yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, we want to at the end of the day have FreeCAD like really upscale its capabilities now Michelle right now we've got so we've got Steven working on the 3d printer construction set workbench in FreeCAD and you can actually yeah, I, I saw part of the video uh, yeah uh, 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 yeah it's a pity I missed the, the meeting uh, yeah well you don't have to miss it because you go to Steven log and he actually has his new workbench on there already so oh. um 
Yeah, but it doesn't do anything. It's just got, he just programmed the, it's it's called example workbench and you can click on an icon for the frame and it inputs an object into the viewing window. So that's, you know, prototype 1. So now he's able to click on an icon and get things to appear in the window. Um, so that's where we're at with that, but that's a great start. We're programming FreeCAD already. So <laughs> he's going to report on, on, on this probably next week um, to the team. So we look forward to that. But yeah, we, we got to basically keep going with that. Just keep, uh, keep working with FreeCAD. If, I mean, if anyone knows Python, they could start getting involved in that. So, uh, and that's something we'd uh, down the road. Uh, I asked Stephen also to teach us some Python in the Python environment, probably in brackets, if that's acceptable. Uh, just do it in. Uh, YouTube, uh, if we knew Python better, uh, I could write uh, an add on for Blender to, to do the explosion, export the explosion view model. Yeah. Um, and you could like, make uh, one keyframe and an animation, just position the parts uh, in XYZ in Blender and export it as a, as a JavaScript code. And, and Blender is Python? So Blender is Python as well. Um, the add-ons. Uh, add-ons are Python. Part of the programming too, but I think uh, a lot of the programming is C++. Okay. Uh, it's a combination of. Uh... Yeah. Yeah. Very good. So this is excellent. So anyway, to continue on the meeting here. So so let's just uh, wrap up a couple of things. So we've got a bunch of people on. Um, uh, on this meeting but if if there's any roles to be divvied out uh, so definitely Josh is working on the quick attach so I'm gonna put some names here well actually I mean we're supposed to be using our uh, on the devlog there's our scrummy so we should be putting those things in there Jose were you taking notes today Yeah, I just took I took notes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Can we can hear you? Yeah, it's a little bit messy. Just, uh, but yeah, I think the main points are covered. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can you paste them maybe into this doc so we have like the notes, maybe after the first page okay. or something? All right. I will put them. Uh, I think they should be a little bit more formatted. Okay. Uh, Why should I put it? Put yeah, it put it like you know, second page on a doc, work doc. Yeah. Second page. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you mean the? It's uh, perhaps the notes uh, or in the slide because it's a lot of text. I don't know, put it right in the slide, just make the text small. Okay. So you can get right access. People sometimes miss the notes. It's kind of hard to see them, so... Yeah, Uh, where is it? Second slide. Second slide? Yeah. Okay, it's just showing up. Okay. All right. I mean, this has to be a It's a lot of things. Okay. It's all right. That's pretty good. And who wants to be note taker for next week? We want to switch that task between people. Who's going to note take next week? We need a volunteer. Anybody? Yeah. I can do it uh, for, for me. It's, I told you that I'm a little bit. Uh, Okay. Now, uh, it's something I can help, but I don't know if you. I think you want to help. 
Okay. Um, that sounds good. Keep going at it. Uh, so we're we're given. So Josh's working on the loader arms. Um, does anyone want to take a stab at doing an initial geometry for the uh, for the quick attach plate? So basically transferring the stuff we have from the uh, in a link to the Bobcat standard and make a pl mounting plate like that. But not. I wouldn't do the. I mean, the problem with what we did last year was it wasn't. You kind of need a connector plate between the two things, otherwise the geometry can misalign if it's bolted into the front. Anyway, we need a we need somebody to to design something that makes sense. If somebody can do that, anyone feel comfortable about uh, the Bobcat Quick Attach? No, let leave it to me. I'll do that. That's it's too complicated. It's actually the geometry there is quite specific on it. I'm gonna put that for me. So Bobcat, um, so my little task here, it's done. Wheel mounting plate, well, wheel mounting plate is somewhat done um, in that it needs to be modified now as we saw today. So I'm going to add for me the Bobcat's quick attach. Uh, beyond that, I'm going to also take on the tensioning because that's I, that needs to be drawn out. Um, okay. Michael's doing Michelle's busy. Oliver's busy. Salam, computer vision. Will. I can take more, obviously. I, I got through my stuff pretty good. Okay. So, um, whatever part can be broken down, or if there's work that's in yeah. progress, okay. it's more complicated. There's a... I'll look at, uh... Okay. Let's take a look at this. So uh, please go back to slide number with a tractor, slide number eight. There's a, I'm, I'm just starting. Now we can start working out some of the details. Like there's a bunch of details missing. So let's start covering them. So Bobcat standard, I'm going to do that. Um, okay, narrow down the tracks to nine inch. Um, we've got them at, and that's actually pretty quick. So once you take the take the individual track unit, and keep track of the individual track unit uploaded over the old track unit in the part library. The part library being, uh, oh yeah. So the second part is anyone who wants to do accounting stuff. We need to move up, move the part library over from the OSC part library to the tractor page. So move and refine part library. Move part library from OSC part library to tractor construction set. Uh, 2017 page. So some of the general part library, that's obviously for uh, general parts that can be reused over everything, but I guess some of the specific stuff I assume yeah. keep in the tractor library. So Yeah, let's, let's talk about um, the part library just for a second here, just to explain how it works. So the general part library, I think what would, be, what would be good there, so if we go to part library, it's got all the other part libraries, like for example, the first one is the filament part library the second one is the d3d cd home power cube so it, it basically goes project by project so it's a link to the other part library so let's make this an index to the individual projects and not put the individual parts for the machines so that uh, and maybe i mean because this page is going to get pretty long at the end of the day let's put all the tractor stuff on the tractor library so that people will know if okay if this is the tractor or the micro track go to those respective libraries and use this as a master index pretty much so let's do that. Does that make sense, Abe? Okay, so, yeah, so we really need to reduce um, some of these parts. Well, I don't know about the modules. Let's see, construction set modules. I mean, there are some universal parts, but yeah, I see yeah. a bunch of other parts in there that should just be moved to the yeah. tractor. So. Yeah, there's universal parts where... I don't know. We can start like uh, maybe another category, like for example, universal parts library, so that we yeah, just I was keep kind this of plan. I mean, we have the fastener workbench, right? And I think some people make bolts. I see it stuff like that, even though there's a fastener library in the thing. But sometimes you need those different different bolts, and I 
was kind of assuming that we probably need to just expand the fastener library in FreeCAD, but it might also be useful to have a fastener library because that's an obvious yeah. division. I, I, uh, I would say I would say so. A fastener library for OSC, which we download. I mean, there's going to be lots of different ones, lots of different bolts, but then very specific ones that we use often, and we're trying to actually reduce that set, like. For the tractor, like for the heavy machines, we're just trying to stick to one inch bolts. You know, forget about like three quarter, just do like make everything one inch, keep it simple. But things like that, just to keep things yeah. most most general. And obviously, it might not be just bolts and, and generic stuff, it might be the custom uh, pins, like the pins right. in the, um, I'm not sure what you're using in the tracks, but right. those, those pins might be. Uh, a more custom item that yeah. gets used more universally. Yeah, bolts and pins, those are a very common thing. We need a hyd I mean, we need a hydraulics part library. Uh, and that's actually a good way to go. And then, in terms of making these libraries, because then we can pull off everything from that library, like whenever we, we're working on hydraulics, we go there as our first stop. So it is useful. And then, PVC library, like for example, in a CD home. I mean, there's plumbing, and plumbing is typically PVC or pipe, uh, pipe fittings library. Um, and then there's just standard metal pipe fittings. So those are things that are immediately very useful. Metal pipe, PVC pipe. I mean, there's construction materials, which already is actually... We can put a link to construction materials because the official FreeCAD library has some construction materials in there. Maybe not so many, but has some. And I know we want to generate that for the CD Eco home because we use standard, like, you know, 2x6 lumber, 2x4 lumber, or whatever. So, um, so some of the construction materials, like, for example, sh metal roofing is already, for example, in the official FreeCAD library that's you can find on github um, yeah and it would be useful to assign some people to, to basically like have stewards of these different libraries so you know as we get people to stabilize with the project you know some people can maintain those different libraries because we need maintainers for all of these items here uh, so Abe we're gonna continue assigning you here I'm gonna assign the tracks to you Abe um, Back on the wiki, I'd say, I, I don't know if we have some newer people. Um, sometimes I think some of the wiki editing is a good task for uh, new mem new developers. That way they can kind of learn the wiki and things like that too. Yeah. Um, we've got a couple of people applying. German, he just emailed me saying he's got to cut out for a month. And uh, actually, Joseph said he's 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 got really busy with stuff and he can't continue on a team so we got two people leaving for now as far as new people we, we had Salam and German but uh, we don't really have new people until uh, there's like three people in the pipeline that are applying right now so we'll see if we could maybe assign it, it would be nice to kind of onboard people with a, a decent program like okay maintain some of the wiki maybe simple tasks we should refine some of that like a good thing would be to <clears throat> organize part libraries set up the development template uh, things like that, which which go into the process management part, which needs to be documented as well. Yeah. Um, so, uh, regarding some, I'm just going to go through some of these details here real quick. So, add bolting of power cube to the frame. So, add bolt holes, bolt holes and bolts, and washers. Uh, bushings through the metal, like Abe, how you did the bushings through the side. They they actually go inside the the square tubing and the shaft goes inside them so maybe I'll keep putting Abe on that those things um, align idlers you mentioned Abe that they're not aligned I I just did that a while ago oh you did um, now I didn't correct whatever it's going on with the sprocket yet because I yeah. assume I don't know how that needs to be moved. Well, um, we just need to extend that plate right. that's there. We just need to change the plate. Okay. And that will depend on the 
yeah assume that the motor is pretty correct but that plate simply needs to be extended up it just needs to be taller that's it so we got to go to the underlying sketch and work from there um, but yeah it's just an extension of that not a big deal but also so there's that extend the plate there's add the bolts to mount the motor to the plate um, align idlers add bolts to to motor plate well bolt holes plus bolts to motor plate plus motor those bolts bolt holes are not in there um, if that's in the underlying sketch then that could be changed readily so that's good um, but I guess the you know the effectiveness in doing this relies on being effective at finding all the parts. So so the workflow once again is go to the we got to create the part library, but then just you know take the plate, go to the original source file, just delete the plate here. So so here's the plate, delete. Then you go into the original source file and then then do file merge, and what I've been doing. A lot is actually uploading positionally correct files to this part library so that when we up uh, merge it's already shown up in the correct position so for example actually to go back here if this plate is as such what I want to do right now is just extract this plate so copy and paste so add make a new document and paste it into a new document uh, and there's my little plate in the new document and if I save this right here, Control S, then I can um, upload this as a positionally correct version into the part library. So that's the preferred workflow. It's it helps. So you don't have to when you import it, you don't have to move it around. It's already there, and that would be very useful to do. So uh, try to do that whenever possible, and import the new thing. So the effectiveness lies in getting rid of parts uploading uh, well saving them in a positionally correct position uh, modifying them merging them so that would be a uh, the very simple basic workflow okay uh, just a couple more notes here clamp um, like the clamps link look at the clamps those clamps need to go underneath the tractor Right now, there's nothing preventing the shaft from moving back and forth, so those clamps would go underneath next to the plate. Um, so the clamps would clamp around the shaft here and be right next to the plate, so the clamp is stiff and nothing is moving. This axle here is not rotating. The, the bearings are what rotates. The idler rotates. The shaft is solid and fixed. Um, so that's clamps. Power cube, suction hose, power outlet to the quick connect coupler, um, and I drew that up. Where's my? Oh, what happened there? It's right there. Um, no, this one right here. Look at that. This piece. See that quick coupler? That goes into the outlet of the pump. Where's the outlet of the pump? The outlet of the pump is right there. That's a quick coupler pair that you're seeing there. Right now, the coupler is plugged into the the return of the the cooler. So this is the pump outlet right there. That's that's what needs to happen there. That's the explanation there. Add two set screws to idlers. So if you look at the idlers, let's look at idler detail. What's holding that idler from shifting on the shaft here? There's two set screws in the idler collar there. Those just need, we want to add those to make sure that and here that looks transparent to me. I'm going to make it appearance, get rid of the transparency. Okay, so in this collar right there, that part, that part right there, there's two set screws in there that poke into the shaft, so this this bearing does not slide on the shaft. <clears throat> and then the four bolts 
in this idler they need to have bolts in them this is all like the details that once we get really to perfect this and actually build it all those details matter so what exactly is the length of that bolt what is the correct length so that bolt doesn't interfere with anything else for example and so forth um, so that's where you know we can start getting into the details like that bolt in there we're not showing the bolt that's you know that length is critical set set screws in this collar are critical because you gotta put them on before you do the tracks otherwise they're hard to access um, little details add bolts to idler plates right that's what I just mentioned so that's that's some of the details so we gotta continue working on this whoever gets to that first please uh, do it if you don't have a task please uh, take on one of these and the other tasks for anyone who is truly unemployed would be to now uh, in the November workshop wait was it Oct no October 27th through the 29th we're gonna build this thing I'm gonna prototype that here we've got the power cube and we've got the tracks and pieces here that we can start prototyping um, but at the event we're gonna build a uh, basically two of these units and the wider units gonna have two power cubes next to one another so we're gonna make a wide base version of this so for that we need a wide platform which is 40 inches and then we can talk about how we connect the front piece to the back uh, which means that the operator is no longer gonna be riding on a back they're actually gonna sit in a cab so we're gonna have to provide enough room for both the power cube uh, so let's let's just take a look at that real quick um, so in a wide version of the tractor we're gonna expand the width twice but also probably put room extend to the front such that we can put an operator cab in there where the operator actually sits and not on top because that would make this thing already too tall I want to keep it low to the ground say low and safe so we widen this we can still use the same tracks absolutely identical these shafts are three inch shafts they're overbuilt to easily hold like uh, like 10 tons of weight easily uh, the tracks right now here they're shown in I think 3 eighths inch or one half inch one half inch is what we actually used in a machine that's super overbuilt so you can make a very heavy duty machine out of this the current length right there is half an inch for the tracks as you see there um, but that's way overbuilt and this machine right here as far as comparison to the Toradingo this thing with the current hydraulic wheel drive has 7,000 pounds of push force that's way more than the Toro Dingo I think the Toro Dingo might have like I'm guessing maybe up to 2,000 maybe but I'm guessing more like 1,000 uh, we should actually take a look at what the specs for the Toro Dingo on the wheel drive are but here we have 7,000 without any gear down because the motors are very strong and if we double this up we're gonna have 14,000 pounds so that's some decent bulldozing capacity uh, so we widen this twice, put a cab on the front of it, and then attach, do a, a connection between the front and back sections to do the two-piece articulated steering version where cylinders are going to steer the back and front piece. So that's that's the general idea here. It might be uh, probably the best configuration is the two power cubes that are side to side, and then the cab could be either in front or even in the middle, possibly. Um, but we just have to draw that up so the next step on this would be to widen the the base here if it's 20 inches right now it will we should do it possibly up to like um, I would make it not even 40 but 60 60 inches because if you have the tracks on the outside the tracks are only about add another 10 inches on each side so altogether you'd have 80 inches now 80 is a little under seven feet so seven feet width that's pretty good I mean eight foot wide is what you want to keep your machine to but we're still under eight feet so I would make this even like 
possibly 60 inches. We can kind of have to play with that to see what's, what makes most sense. But right now I would migrate from this version here to a version that's 60 inches wide where you can even put three power cubes. So maybe the solution is it's it's 80 inch, um, the 60 inches wide, we put three power cubes say on the back piece and one power cube on the front so that the cab can fit easily on the front. And maybe this power cube here um, is side to side so that the cab has more space if you guys follow what I'm saying here. But basically the geometry needs to be such that we can easily fit a cab and the geometry is nice workable and easy access for the operator and so forth. Um, so it would make a case for 60 inch wide platform and possibly like three power cubes on one and one power cube on the other side. Uh, something like that to make it easy to fit. Or maybe even like the front whole front is just the cab and all the back is all the power cubes, four power cubes. So we can play with different configurations. But right now I would go for, um, if we go to the main, uh, let, let's actually do a new slide for the big tractor. So big tractor. Uh, let's let's start with a with a platform, 60 inches, 60 inch wide, and how long? Well, uh, if we consider 20 inches, like say we we make this side to side, it's 20 inches wide. We want say like um, I would call out for about three feet for the operator, like one meter. So like 30, let's call it even, call it 40 inches plus 20 inches is 60 inches. So that's exactly 5 feet, so 5 feet long, uh, if we're talking in feet here. Um, so actually it makes it 60 inches wide and 60 inches long. Let's, let's start with that as a workable thing and see how the geometries all fit uh, for the next tractor. So once again, the geometry here would be, you've got one tractor piece in the front, another tractor piece in the back and then they're connected and with hydraulic cylinders to do steering articulation steering back and forth uh, side to side rather and then the tracks of course are here on the sides so a machine that looks like this and we're doing tracks tracks are really good uh, we can then modify this in the future for wheel drive because because literally wheels can be attached just like the tracks can be attached. If you replace this with a wheel, you've got a, a wheel drive. Um, and that would be quite interesting because the same identical drive system could drive the wheel. You can drive that wheel through the chain. Um, so you have, just like here, you've got the sprocket and then you can have a wheel with a chain uh, with another sprocket on that wheel so you actually drive that wheel but that's one way to do it to use the identical geometry once again for like multi-purpose craziness that we typically do here uh, that would be an option and if you have a chain drive then a chain drive allows you to to do various gear downs depending on the size of the wheel and size of the sprockets you can have different uh, gear down or gear up for slower or faster motion so I think I'll quit right here. So anyone uh, who doesn't have anything, please select one of the tasks. Uh, I don't know if I missed anyone. Let me see, um, just going real quick through. So Abe has got some, Roberto's busy on instructional, Christian's doing the, Christian, you d busy on ISO stuff? Not really on ISO, but actually I was helping. Um, oh yeah, helping Michael. I, I wanted Jitsi, right? You, you want Jitsi and I, I wanted yeah. to do Jitsi. Yeah, so, yeah. Actually, yeah, I'm busy. <laughs> yep. Uh, so we're doing install Jitsi on our server, which is awesome. So we can do better communications once we have more people. Dixon, uh, Dixon, are you up to anything? Do you have some time? Uh, I, 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 I don't. I haven't finished my weed collection. We've got a pretty bad drought going on here, so I'm really okay. struggling to find specimens. But I am. I did make time to meet with four students who are interested in becoming developers tonight. So awesome. hopefully I can put them in contact with you soon. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Get, get more people the on the few team. Weeks I, should, I should be useful again after I get this uh, collection finished. Okay, sounds good. And Israel, I don't know if, uh, is Israel here? 
Only thing I'm seeing is real. Um, Jose is a bit busy. Josh has got stuff. Myself, I've got. Michael's busy on the server. Michelle's doing WebGL. Oliver's in the background doing some uh, documentation of torch table work. Uh, and we've got that workshop coming up, so that's that's happening. No kidding on that. Salam's working on a computer vision. I haven't heard from him. Sarah, um, I haven't heard. Will, Will is somewhat ad hoc here. Um, Antonio, haven't heard from him so much. Um, so, yeah. It looks like we're pretty much allocated. So, people, please continue. We'll work on a um, on tractor. Now, I'm going to just post that announcement right up on this Saturday. So, we'll see if we can get uh, this looking more complete with the loader arms and a quick attach. And have a nice, uh, relatively decent looking machine that we can uh, put into the advertisement for the workshop itself. And right now it stands as we definitely want to do the... So the tractor small and big version, the gasifier on the back of this or on the front, uh, small gasifier for running on charcoal, which we've done before, and the computer vision, if we can get that uh, from Salam. Uh, so we'll see what can happen. But the idea is to focus on the tractor, do all the documentation around that, keep evolving the, the workflows uh, to make it more efficient. Then we can do the full documentation, doing things like um, I I pointed uh, Roberto to these Gundam instructionals, and this is kind of like I think an evolution of the language agnostic instructionals. Let me just take take a look at that uh, real quick. We we did a blog post about that um, some time ago. Okay, it's getting really late here, actually. We should go Gundam build instruction. Take a look at this here. Um, this is a blog post, but basically there's this, like the toys, these uh, toys from the Far East there. They have these language agnostic instructionals that are a little different than what we do, but they're kind of nice. They're they're kind of like exploded part part diagrams but they're a little more than that they kind of show you a little more information so take a look at that but that's something we probably want to do for the tractor and probably add that to our skill set of uh, documentation so I'm just gonna put a note here on documentation I think it would be nice to augment our language agnostic instructionals with some of this uh, this other yeah these other build instruction styles okay so with that said I think that's about it we let's see if there's any quick questions here open PML open PLM open PLM no haven't Taking a look at it. What stats of login of obviously of our can't sign up by email is listed as having an account. That's a question for for Lex. Um, as far as Lex goes, Lex is on a developer list. But you can probably respond. Let's see. He's on the main thread, I believe. But if if it's not, um, it's. You can email him at lex at Bresney dot com. Yep. So do that. Okay, everybody. So that was a long meeting. Let's let's continue going. Um, for this week, let's just continue interacting on the on where we are with the the CAD. If you guys want to check in on a Saturday, like I'll, I'll be around like noon time to one. So we can do a quick check in where we are with the CAD. That would be useful. And that evening, I'm going to aim to publish whatever we have on the CAD. Do some, maybe do some nice renderings, so that we have an attractive announcement for people 
And I think this is very exciting. I think a lot of people are excited about the tractor. And f at least for us, it's very practical. It's uh, We're going to be using that here. And hopefully there's going to be replications coming about. So let's check in on uh, for anyone who wants to on Saturday for the little office hours where we uh, kind of go over where we are on the, the CAD and maybe wrap up any loose ends on that and get ready for publishing this event to uh, Eventbrite and to our website. Um, that'll be it. Okay, so thank you everybody. And we'll see you next time. So either Saturday or next week, regular meeting time. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Ciao.